developed in a joint operation by the Vesadan and Terran governments, the GTF Ulysses is an excellent all-around fighter. It offers superior maneuverability and a high top speed. The Apollo is the most common GDA fighter. It is highly versatile and can perform multiple roles, including space superiority, interception, and assault. Using the old GTF Angel Scout fighter as a template, the GDA created the Valkyrie Interceptor fighter. It has two additional engines, as well as an additional set of primary hardpoints. This makes the Valkyrie the best bomber interceptor in the fleet. Its speed is unmatched in the GDA, and its maneuverability is above average. Its only drawbacks are a small secondary payload and a weak hull. The Hercules is the slowest and most unmanageable fighter in the fleet. This is offset, however, by its overpowering weaponry and shielding. It carries six primary weapons, as well as two full secondary banks. This heavy assault fighter is best suited for small target attacks and bomber escort. Designed by GDI engineers, the Loki is undoubtedly the best reconnaissance craft in Terran or Vesadan service. Its hull shape and shielded reactor chamber lends itself to providing a low sensor profile, yet it is capable of very high speed maneuvers. Its relatively light armament and low armor rating make it unsuitable for extended firefights, however. The smallest bomber in the fleet, the Athena has oftentimes been mistaken for a fighter. However, one should not be fooled by its small size. The Athena can carry light bombs and most missiles. It also has the ability to dogfight well. Its strong shielding and hull make it the favored lightning bomber of the GDA. Another product of GDI R&D, the Zeus Strike Bomber is a worthy successor to the Athena. Its balanced design and increased reactor capacity give it remarkable speed for a bomber, yet it still remains capable of carrying the powerful tsunami bombs. These features will make the Zeus a versatile and effective weapon against capital ships. The Medusa is the standard attack bomber in the GDA. Its strong shielding and large secondary capacity make it the favored attack craft against cruiser class targets. As the first bomber to carry the tsunami bomb, the Medusa is considered the staple of any bomber pilot's career. The Ursa is the first bomber designed specifically for the purpose of annihilating capital ships. It carries a massive payload and is the only bomber in the GDA which can equip the Harbinger bomb. Strong shielding and hull make the Ursa very difficult to destroy. The Amazon is a simple drone, used for basic combat training. They are unmanned, and carry only the weakest of weaponry. The Advanced Amazon is a larger drone, used by the GDA for subsystem and large target training. They are unmanned and inexpensive. The Centaur support ship is designed to get in and out of battle as quickly as possible. It is fast and quite maneuverable, allowing it to dock with fighters in a minimum amount of time. Most notable about the Centaur, however, is its extremely large explosion radius. The amount of warheads carried on a support ship makes it very dangerous to be close to an exploding centaur. Since the start of space colonization, this standard transport has been used by everyone, both civilian and military. While it has undergone minor changes time and again, it remains a simple design, a vehicle meant to transport personnel from one place to another. The Poseidon is the standard military freighter in the GDA. It is designed to protect its cargo from any kind of attack, and has four turrets with which to do so. The TC-2 is the standard issue cargo container in the GDA for deep space cargo transport. It has all the electronics and systems needed to preserve any cargo within it at whatever conditions are necessary. TC-2s are cheap to manufacture and are heavily used throughout the Alliance. The TSC-2 was developed when Terran Command decided it needed a stronger and more secure cargo container for use in military operations. 
It improves on the established TC2 design by sacrificing a small amount of internal space for a significantly stronger hull. Although it is still not as strong as the TAC-1, the TSC-2 is usually the GDA's container of choice for cargo with military value. The TTC-1 is another example of civilian equipment used by the GDA League of Defense. It is primarily a tech container used for research purposes, especially zero-g development operations. It is not very strong, however, and is often a target of enemy attacks. The Kronos is a freighter of civilian design. As the Terran V Sedan War dragged on, more and more of these vessels were commissioned by the GDA for use in military operations. These vessels are slow but strong. The TAC-1, called the Tacon by most pilots, is a heavily armored container, usually used for carrying volatile or dangerous substances. It is also the preferred supply container for use in frontline operations. The mainstay of the Terran fleet, these vessels have served in both strike and defense purposes. From bow to stern a Fenris measures 260 meters. With a full array of weapon systems and a strong enough hull to withstand the strongest enemy warheads, a Fenris cruiser can be found in almost any system that the GDA is operating in. The Fenris was originally designed as a strike weapon, hence its fast speed and decent turning rate. It was later decided that a second line of cruisers would be produced, for defensive purposes, once it became apparent that the TV war wouldn't be over in a few months. After the Vesadans began making incursions into GDA space, Command decided that it needed a new defensive cruiser. Changes to the Fenris led to the GTC Leviathan line of cruisers, produced as mobile defense battleships. Their speed and maneuverability were greatly reduced in trade-off for more powerful weapons and a stronger hull. Production was discontinued when the GDA thought they would win the Vesadan War after the Battle of Gulnara, and then production was started up again after the defeat at the Delania system. Because of the on-again off-again nature of this vessel's production, almost all Leviathan cruisers have different armaments, but all have consistent hulls and speeds. The Faustus science vessel was, and still is, a civilian craft. However, in the 14 years since the Terran Bay Sedan War began, more and more of these were commissioned by the GDA in order to pursue military research. Its obvious value, poor fighting capabilities, and lack of speed make it a prime target for enemy ships, hence, you will rarely find many of these anywhere near the front lines of battle. The standard Terran probe is an all-purpose instrument that can be used in a variety of situations. They are found in missions ranging from unmanned exploration of new systems, to scientific observation of interesting areas of space, to surveying of patrol routes or suspected enemy positions. In a pinch, they can be deployed as communications boys or as couriers for important messages or scientific data. Their great speed and small size make them useful in battle situations where the enemy will most probably give them a low target priority. The Orion is the capital ship of the GDA. Measuring a frightening 2.1 kilometers in length, the cost to build one of these far outweighs the cost of paying the crew of this ship for three years. There is no more important symbol of Terran pride than a ship like the Galatea or the Intrepid cruising past a colonized planet, patrolling the system and ensuring safety. In the course of the 14-year war, very few of these have ever been lost, making the destruction of an Orion a truly horrible defeat. The GTD Hades is a new class of Terran destroyer constructed under the authority of the GDI. Not much is known of its design or purpose, but it appears to be an attempt to recreate the SD Lucifer. All available data on the Hades has been highly classified by Terran Command. The Hades should be considered more dangerous than a Class A threat. Early Terran space stations were constructed much smaller, and were mostly used for zero-g research purposes. Later on, with advancements in space construction technologies, stations grew bigger and bigger. When the first Arcadia-class station was commissioned, GDA decided to reclassify it as an installation rather than a space station. Used for a variety of purposes, almost all major systems are home to at least one installation, 
which is often used as the center of trade and communications. Home to scores of small ships, including repair vessels, fighters, and transports, an Arcadia-class installation is always a safe haven for a convoy of attack ships, returning from battle. Where the Orion is the symbol of Terran power, the Arcadia is the shining beacon of stability. The Terran NAV buoy is widely used in both civilian and military fields. It stores precalculated jump coordinates and other navigational data for use by Terran convoys, and it is also capable of acting as a communications relay. The watchdog is the standard unmanned defensive sentry turret for the GDA. It fires two standard plasma bursts at any nearby hostile targets. The Cerberus is an advanced version of the watchdog, with stronger weaponry and the ability to withstand more damage. The Hermes escape pod has been used since the destruction of the GTD Goliath over 12 years ago. They are used by the crews of destroyers and installations to escape destruction. It is always best to be prepared. The Anubis is the weakest fighter in the Vesadan Navy. However, these fighters are extremely cheap to manufacture, and are often used in swarm situations to try to overwhelm the opponent with numbers. A few radical Vesadans have been known to load these ships with explosives and attempt to steer themselves into GDA capital ships. The first occurrence of this was the Battle of Rixias IV, where the GTD Goliath was destroyed by a squadron of kamikaze pilots. Due to its lack of afterburners and low weapon capacity, the GDA has classified the Anubis as a Class D threat. As the slowest fighter in the PVN, the Seth has earned itself a reputation as the turtle of the Vesudan fleet. Even though it is quite compact in size, the Seth can carry a massive payload and has a lot of shielding. Its standard impulse engines aren't very powerful, but the Seth gains an incredible speed boost when using its afterburners. The Seth is primarily used in convoy attacks and capital ship escort duties. The GDA considers the PVF Seth to be a Class C threat. The Horus Interceptor can outrun any ship in the PVN or the GDA. This makes it extremely dangerous. Its above average weapons capacity, combined with its good maneuverability and shielding, make this one of the most well designed interceptors in the galaxy. This ship is responsible for the destruction of more GDA bombers than any other. As a C class threat, Horus interceptors should be dealt with as quickly as possible. The Thoth is the most dangerous ship to be created by the PVN. Manufactured solely at the Alta Irian shipyards, the Thoth has only been produced in small numbers as of yet. When the Alta Irian yards defected to the Hammer of Light, the production of Thoths by the PVN dropped to nil. The Thoth is now completely in the hands of the Hammer of Light. What makes the Thoth so versatile is its small size, extremely high maneuverability, and advanced weapon systems. In the hands of a skilled pilot, it is extremely difficult to hit. The design for the Thoth was simultaneous with the design for the Ulysses, and these two ships were designed by some of the same technicians. Thus they are quite a match for our Ulysses class fighters. This is why they are considered a B-class threat. Any non-registered Thoths should be destroyed immediately, and their presence reported upon completion of the mission. The Osiris has now become the standard bomber for use in PVN operations. It has replaced the Amun, correcting many of the faults of its predecessor. It is not quite as sturdy, but it has nearly the same weapons capacity, and is faster and more maneuverable. The Osiris should be considered a C-class threat to Fenris cruisers and a D-class threat otherwise. The Amun is the Vesudan's heaviest bomber class ship. It carries a massive payload and has been responsible for the destruction of at least three Orion-class destroyers in the past two years. Fortunately, it is slow and has low maneuverability, making it an easy target for our fighters. Fighter pilots should be wary of the two turrets on this ship, they are not to be ignored. The Amun is considered a B-class threat to all cruisers and capital ships. They should be given top priority in target selection during escort operations. The Scarab is very similar to our Centaur, and we believe the Vesudan stole the design of this ship from us. 
It is used for in-flight rearming of fighters and bombers. In longer engagements, these ships can mean the difference between victory and defeat. The major difference between this ship and the Centaur is that the Scarab is unmanned. The Isis transport is quite fast and maneuverable for a ship of its size. Most often it is used for personnel transfer, although occasionally this class has been known to act as a repair ship or tugboat. It is well protected with its turrets, and it is not unheard of for the PVN to use a wing of Isis's to conduct an assault on a fortified position. The Bast freighter is unarmed, and considered a non-threat. We believe that it is mainly used by Vaisedan civilians, but we have seen some in frontline operations. It has very low target value, but should be destroyed, as any kind of resupply ship is a danger to the GDA. The standard Vaisedan cargo container is only slightly different from our own. The primary difference is that the Vaisedan cargo containers are capable of atmospheric as well as deep space deployment. Vaisedans used cargo containers well before we did, as they needed to transport raw materials from other systems to their own barren world. Our standard cargo container was modeled after theirs, although ours is slightly superior in durability. With three turrets, the Ma'at is a hairy target for GDA pilots to attack. However, it is slow enough that it can be destroyed with enough patience. As always, supply ships for the PVN are considered to be valid targets. The VAC-4 series of cargo containers is much like its normal counterpart, except it has much more plating. However, this container is no more dangerous than the standard version, and is nothing more than ML-16 bait without protection of some kind. The dreaded Satis freighter was thought to be a warship when it was first encountered in the Aldebaran encounter. It has five turrets and a strong hull, making it quite dangerous to the inexperienced pilot. However, most experienced pilots in the GDA know enough to attack the Satis main weakness, its weak plating around the turrets. Disarming a Satis is most often the best way to destroy it. While capturing supply ships is often an intelligent plan, the Satis has been considered dangerous enough to rank as a Class C threat. Treat it as one. The Aden class cruiser, while far stronger than most of the Vaisedan's warships, falls short as a attack cruiser. It does not have the armor or the firepower to stand up to GDA weaponry. With a cruiser speed of 25M-S and only 6 weapon turrets, the Aden just cannot muster the kind of firepower needed to do real damage to targets of size. Most GDA pilots have learned to exploit the primary weakness of the Aden, its extremely weak weapons subsystem. The Aden class cruiser is considered by the GDA to be a class B threat. The PVSC Imhotep This large probe is more of a fully fledged research pod. The PVSC Imhotep is the standard Vaisedan research vessel. Like our GTSC Faustus, the Imhotep can fill a variety of scientific roles, including performing onboard research and conducting sensor surveys. One major difference between the two classes is that the Imhotep carries a small pod bay housing four remote research pods. These pods are frequently launched to augment the Imhotep's onboard systems. This large probe is more of a fully fledged research pod than a simple drone. Designed to work in collaboration with an Imhotep science cruiser or as part of team of probes, it is capable of numerous roles including observation, experimentation, and scientific analysis. It is often possible for a wing of probes to conduct minor missions independent of outside supervision, allowing Vaisedan Command to reserve their Imhotep's for deployment where the personal presence of scientists is most needed. Where the Aden cruiser failed, the Typhon succeeded well past expectations. The Typhon is an incredible work of engineering and the model of Vaisedan technology. When the first one was sighted at the Vega engagement, it was laughed at by our technicians as a foolish display of non-utilitarian design. The subsequent destruction of the GTD Eisenhower and the obliteration of the 4th Fleet changed their minds very quickly. The Typhon should never be underestimated. It wields massive weaponry, and has more armor plating than any Terran destroyer. Its only known weakness is its turret armor, which is significant, but lower than expected. In the two years since this ship first appeared, 
we have only managed to destroy two of them. The Typhon is considered a Class A threat to any ships within the same system. Do not engage without backup. The Gargantuan Karnak installation is the Vesudan's answer to the GDI Arcadia. This monstrous facility bristles with dozens of turrets and can house up to two full squadrons of fighters. Its primary purpose is to serve as a construction and maintenance yard for the Vesudan fleets. Because of its enormous logistical and strategic value, the Karnak is considered a Class A threat. The Vesudan NAV buoy is widely used in both civilian and military fields. It stores precalculated jump coordinates and other navigational data for use by Vesudan convoys, and it is also capable of acting as a communications relay. The ANK is the standard Vesudan sentry gun. Its most common usage is guarding supply depots. However, since the development of the Anubis, its usage has dropped off significantly. The RA has been used by Vesudan since our first encounter with them. Every Vesudan capital ship has a few of these lifeboats. The RA, the Shivan Dragon is easily the most impressive fighter craft we have yet seen. Its maneuverability is unmatched, and it has quite a few other advantages, including a good top speed, powerful afterburners, and strong shields. It is the only Shivan fighter we have been able to study up close, and we have learned a great deal about Shivan engineering from it. It seems that the Shivan shield systems are extremely strong, but their hulls are far weaker than our own. They also rely on primary weapons far more than secondaries, as evidenced by the Dragon's small missile capacity. The GDA considers the Dragon as a Class A threat. The Basilisk seems to be a Shivan heavy attack fighter. It is not as maneuverable as other Shivan fighters, but it packs quite a punch, and it is very resistant to our weaponry. Most often they have been used in attacking our supply convoys and transports. Treat the Basilisk as a Class C threat. We believe that the Manticore is a Shivan interceptor. It has a very high top speed, and its maneuverability is quite good. However, its shield system isn't strong enough to withstand constant fighting for long, which leads us to believe the Manticore's primary purpose is to destroy enemy bombers. The Manticore ranks as a Class B threat. We originally thought the Scorpion was the Shivan's best fighter. However, we now believe that the Scorpion is nothing more than a Shivan scout ship. Their vast numbers and seeming unimportance to the Shivan war effort leads us to this belief. Regardless of its purpose, the Scorpion is highly maneuverable, fast, and difficult to destroy. It can also do damage equivalent to our space superiority fighters. In the event that you encounter Scorpions, regard them as a Class C threat. The Shaitan Bomber is only slightly superior to our own bombers, its shielding is better, but its capacity seems to be far worse. Perhaps the Shivans were confident that they would only need one payload to destroy a target. We consider the Shaitan to be a Class C threat. The Nephilim class bomber is the most alien of the Shivan ships. We are still unsure as to why the Shivans chose this odd shape for arguably their most powerful attack craft. However, with four primary cannons and two turrets, as well as a massive payload, the Nephilim is undoubtedly a serious threat to the GDA. We have already lost two Orion-class destroyers to wings of Nephi limbs. Unless we learn a weakness soon, we will most likely lose two more. The Nephilim has been designated a Class A threat to GDA destroyers and cruisers. In unpopulated systems, it is to be considered a Class B threat. The new Seraphim class bomber is the Shivan's latest threat. It is three times larger than a Nephilim and carries a massive payload at least 150% the size of the Nephilim. With strong hulls and an almost impenetrable shield system, the Seraphim is easily the most dangerous bomber we have yet encountered. The Seraphim has been designated a Class A threat to GDA destroyers and cruisers. In unpopulated systems, it is to be considered a Class B threat. 
The Azrael is most likely a Shivan transport. While we are not completely sure of its uses, we do know that it can house many Shivans. It is not very heavily armored, and its weaponry is not too strong. This makes the Azrael the most common target for capture attempts. The Mephisto freighter behaves much like one of our own, but it is far more powerful and dangerous. Very little data is available on this ship class. We believe that the Shivans use cargo containers such as these as storage depots. We have yet to see a Shivan land on a planet. This leads us to believe that the Shivans plan on keeping all of their materials and resources in deep space. Almost no data is available on the Asmodeus freighter. We are aware that it has a strong hull and four turrets. Any further data on this ship should be immediately delivered to Terran intelligence. What we have dubbed the SAC-2 is simply a more heavily armored form of the standard Shivan cargo container. We believe that this is where the Shivans keep their more precious supplies. SAC-2s are to be captured or destroyed at every opportunity. The Kane is by far the most common cruiser in the Shivan fleet. It is also the weakest. However, the Kane should not be underestimated. It has many turrets, as well as a cluster bomb defensive mechanism. As a strike cruiser, the Kane mostly appears in attacks against GDA or PVN capital ships and cruisers. In these cases, it should be destroyed immediately. The primary weakness of the Kane appears to be its unshielded turrets. Most of the turrets on the Kane can be destroyed with minimal damage. The Kane is a Class B threat. While far more rare than its counterpart, the Kane class cruiser, the Lilith is one of the most ferocious cruisers we have had the misfortune of combating. It has extremely strong weapon systems, as well as a very thick armor which our cannons can barely penetrate. One for one, the Lilith can easily destroy any of our cruisers. It is for this reason that they should be considered a primary target for all bomber squadrons in the GDA. The Lilith should be considered a Class A threat to any ships that encounter it. While the Demon Class Destroyer is easily one of the most massive ships we have yet seen, it is not the biggest or most powerful in the Shivan Armada. However, it is still quite dangerous, with a plethora of missile turrets and two full squadrons of fighters. It is suggested that these capital ships be destroyed by bombers, as all cruisers that have attempted to engage a demon have been destroyed. The demon is a Class A threat in any allied system. We believe that the sole purpose of the Trident is to guard Shivan repair and supply depots. It is not too strong, but in large numbers it can be dangerous. The Lucifer is the greatest threat to the survival of the GDA, the PVN, and both the Terran and Vesadan species. It wields three massive flux cannons which can destroy one of our capital ships in a few hits. These same cannons have been seen bombarding colonized worlds. With four full fighter squadrons and a massive array of defensive turrets, the Lucifer would be extremely difficult to destroy in a normal situation. The fact that it is protected by a sheath shielding system which makes it completely impervious to any kind of kinetic or plasma damage makes it impossible to destroy. We have yet to find a way to breach this shielding technology. It is hoped that a solution will be found soon. Assuming that a solution is found, we have managed to gather enough data on the Lucifer to destroy it. In a recon mission, we were able to determine that the Lucifer is powered by five reactors across its surface. If these reactors are destroyed in a short amount of time, the Lucifer will be stopped. If we cannot stop the Lucifer, we do not expect to be able to defeat the Shivans. We have no way of knowing if there is more than one Lucifer class destroyer. However, any that exists should be considered more dangerous than a Class A threat. Argon laser weapon, uses transparent ceramic technology in order to create an optical system that is extremely durable and stable under battle conditions, provides adequate destructive damage to the hull of enemy ships by vaporizing molecular bonds at the target area and destabilizing molecular bonds across the grain of the hull material. The GDA issues ML-16 lasers to every fighter and bomber in service. A gas-focused Krypton laser, when the ship is in flight, 
the chamber of the GTW41 rotates at a constant speed, a small amount of NO2 is injected into the container.05 milliseconds prior to the emission of the laser light, the rotation of the NO2 in the chamber focuses the laser pulse to a state that is only very slightly, 1%, diffused, after the laser pulse is emitted from the chamber into space, the chamber expels the NO2 into space, thus expelling ionized molecules and moisture, the process repeats for each subsequent burst of laser energy, as this laser is very slightly diffused, it is not effective as a destructive weapon, but as a tactical weapon, the disruptor cannon is best suited and is used for the permanent disabling of enemy ship subsystems. A rapid fire, computer controlled radar and gun system, capable of firing at a rate of more than 4,500 rounds per minute used primarily for close defense situations, uses closed-loop radar technology to locate, identify, and direct a stream of highly destructive 45mm projectiles to the target. With the advent of shield technology, the Avenger is preferred over the ML-16 in any ship that can carry it. Its extra damage against hulls make it one of the best anti-cruiser weapons. It has also proven very effective against Vesadan fighters. However, its substandard anti-shield capabilities make it a poor choice for dock fighting Shivans, although far better than the ML-16. A rapid fire, low energy, ceramic optic focused, Krypton laser, used in tactical situations to distract or lead an enemy to their destruction at the hands of other allied fighters, this weapon, if used over an extended period of in-flight battle, can destroy an enemy fighter, but, as a destructive weapon, should only be used as a last resort. The fast firing rate and high mass of the flail make it great for changing the velocity vector of an enemy fighter or bomber. It is slightly more effective than the Avenger against shields, rated at damage slash second. Its low energy consumption rate makes it useful for prolonged engagements. Note, however, that once you have taken out an enemy's shields, switching to another weapon is advised. Named after the Titan who gave fire to humanity, the Prometheus is a laser-based weapon, an advanced radar and X-ray tracking system lock on the target and determine the target's material structure, argon laser focused via transparent ceramic optics, the laser is generated at the destructive frequency, full out of phase, for the target's material structure, emitted no more than 0.02 milliseconds after targeting and activation by the pilot, the Prometheus stands as one of the GDA's most effective. Deterrence to enemy attack, an effective form of defense for GDA pilots, and as a durable, portable, and highly destructive offensive tool. The Prometheus works best against target hulls. Against shields, it only achieves mediocre performance. Its slow speed and high energy consumption work against it as well. However, the primary advantage of the Prometheus is that it can be equipped on almost any fighter in the GDA. An electromagnetic weapon, sends rapid pulses of exceptionally strong electromagnetic energy resulting in a 1.63 x 10 5J blast that forces its way through any known shield technology and produces a dramatic shearing effect which quickly destroys the target ship's materials, named for the fact that in an atmosphere, the pulse creates an atmospheric disturbance similar to a quasi-human scream at 180 dB, uses up a tremendous amount of available ship energy, already, it is has been used by many GDA fighter aces and test pilots as a coup de grace, although such a use for this massively powerful offensive weapon is officially viewed as poor sportsmanship by the GDA. The Banshee's impressive anti-shielding capabilities make it the weapon of choice against the Shivans. The main limitation of this weapon is low weapons compatibility. Developed as an anti-Shivan weapon, the Shield Breaker inflicts massive damage to enemy defensive systems. This weapon causes no structural damage, but coupling it with an anti-hull cannon is very effective against larger Shivan bombers such as the Seraphim. The leech cannon depletes the power supply of enemy fighters. Use it to disable afterburners, energy weapons, and shields. No subsystems targeting is required, just point and shoot. The leech cannon is an anti-fighter weapon with minimal effect against larger vessels. 
suitable for all space battles, defensive and offensive, medium payload, 16.5 kt, infrared tracking and semi-intelligent targeting, pilot chooses desired target, and the MX-50 tracks the chosen target based off the emission of heat from the engine, the weapon base, and the cockpit of the target ship. The MX-50 will always attack a target that is determined to be hostile by the onboard computer of any GDA combat vessel, thus ensuring a higher kill rate, should the pilot find himself in a heated battle situation where precise aiming might be difficult. Early experiments with energy-based defenses like the deflector array at Ross 128 have shown that this weapon is exceedingly weak against anything besides steel-based targets. Small, fast dumb fire missiles, fired in swarms, GDA fighters can carry more fury missiles than conventional missiles, due to their small size, used for distraction and other tactical measures, very small payload, 3KT. Use is recommended in close combat situations and against larger targets where tracking is a non-issue. All aspect seeking, laser tracking senses energy reflected off a target from the primary weapon systems of the target, increasing single pass kill probability, medium payload, 18.5 kt, missile is designed to pierce reinforced hull, thus securing itself to the target, prior to detonating, 15 milliseconds delay. This is the standard issue fighter killer in the GDA. Designed to take out fighters with minimum hassle, a simple lock is all that is needed to grab the enemy's attention. Short lock time, good speed, and decent payload makes this the best missile to use against all but the strongest ships. Its effectiveness against large targets, however, is less than a typical laser run, making this primarily a ship-to-ship -ship missile. Infrared and ultraviolet tracking, designed to fire in small groups of four missiles per burst, light medium payload per missile, 12 kt, semi-intelligent onboard tracking, single pass kill probability will not exceed 60% on average, designed as an offensive version of the Fury. As a swarm-based weapon, this missile can take out an unshielded fighter without any difficulty. Its four missile system almost guarantees one or two hits, and its speed is quite amazing twice as powerful against naked hulls. All aspect seeking, same tracking system as the interceptor, large payload, 50 kt, but slower than the interceptor, one of the best fire and forget missiles ever developed, many fighter pilots within the GDA regard the Phoenix V as the weapon of choice against high value, heavily defended targets. The number one bomber killer in our arsenal, this is the single most damaging missile that can be equipped on a fighter craft. The longer lock time and slower speed make it less of a dogfight weapon and more of an anti-bomber warhead. Its extra damage against shields makes it especially useful against the Shivan bombers. Advanced signal processing, high precision interception capability, small payload, 9kt combining both conventional explosives and a localized blast of energy caused by the effect of impact upon the laser propulsion system of the missile, designed to temporarily disable subsystems on hostile targets. The D-missile is designed to temporarily stop a cruiser or destroyer from firing its laser turrets. The effect will last about 10 seconds per missile fired, so using these to temporarily disable a cruiser should usually be for suppression until the cruiser is destroyed or whatever was trying to evade the cruiser has gotten out of range. Only a few ships can carry these, and they are very scarce, so proper utilization is important. Missile propulsion unit carrying several small intelligent bomblets, when distance to target is less than 100 m or when time to impact is less than 2 seconds, bomblets direct missile to the most vulnerable part of the ship of those parts of the ship facing the missile, Bomblets then separate from missile propulsion unit and form a sphere, inertia continues to carry bomblets in the direction of the target, the missile propulsion unit continues to advance toward the target, when the missile hits the target or 1.5 seconds. After the missile should have hit the target, the bomblets explode, the spherical shape of the formation of the bomblets helps to ensure a fairly even level of damage across a sensitive area on the target. The spherical shape also ensures that the target will not be able to effectively maneuver away from the blast, 
thus pinning the target to a specific area in space, can also act as dumb fire, medium payload per bomblet, 15 kt, very small payload for missile, 2 kt. Nicknamed the Earthshaker by the bomber pilots who tested this, it is a bomber's best defense against fighters. The synaptic bomb can do a lot of damage to a lot of ships at one time. A second generation synaptic bomb, this GDI developed cluster warhead has been designed for attacks against entire wings of enemy ships. Upon reaching its target, the primary warhead fragments into multiple secondary warheads that explode within a split second. The detonations produce a large field of blast field, making the cluster bomb most effective against fighter formations. Heat seeking, laser tracking similar to the interceptor, missile is protected by a small shield system, allowing for greater success in payload delivery during busy melee situations and intense firefights, fast, but low in-flight maneuverability compared to other missiles of comparable size, low maneuverability due to the size of the missile's payload, 60 kt, and onboard shield system. With the ability to take out most subsystems in one hit, and as simple to fire as an MX-50, the Stiletto is the best ship disabling bomb developed by the GDA. Effective against turrets, engines, and any other kind of subsystem, the Stiletto is a valuable asset to a bomber's arsenal. However, it's slow, unmanageable, and it can't do any real hull damage. Upon impact, the impulse temporarily disables the electronics systems of the target ship, this renders the target ship unable to track targets, manage communications, or gain aspect missile lock. This has numerous tactical applications. For example, a direct hit with an impulse missile will prevent bombers from launching aspect-seeking warheads for several seconds. Once the EMP field has worn off, they must also take the time to reacquire missile lock, granting you valuable time. Intelligent tracking similar to GDA targeting system, prior to launch, communicates with ship computer, gathering data about enemy target types and whereabouts, slow, low maneuverability, antimatter warhead, 500 ton mass to energy conversion, due to instability of antimatter, no more than May 10th be carried on board a GDA bomber at any given time, unless pilot is granted a special permit by an appropriate governing body. The Tsunami has now become the standard Terran bomb used to take out large targets. Its short life requires that you get within 1,500 meters of the target before sending it off, and since it needs a lock to be fired, it takes a brave pilot to fly straight enough for long enough to let one of these fly. A few Tsunamis will take out almost any ship, barring a destroyer. The antimatter warhead also washes over shields a little, so as long as it isn't too close to the center of the blast, a fighter or bomber has a good chance of surviving detonation. Fusion bomb surrounded by three salted fission bombs, propulsion unit is a half-size version of a regulation GDA fighter thruster, class 2, given the weight of the payloads, the missile is slow despite the power of the thruster, as the harbinger is exceptionally large. GDA bombers are limited to carrying six of these weapons at any given time, the resultant shockwave from this weapon is potentially deadly, due to the size of the payloads, 5000 MT in total, use near allied installations or allied ship groupings is strongly discouraged by the GDA, most effective when used in preemptive defensive strike against non-military installations. The Harbinger is our best chance of destroying the Lucifer. Terrans originated on the third planet in the Sol system, known alternately as Terra or Earth. Terrans are relatively physically weak, but are highly intelligent and versatile. This combination of intelligence and versatility have allowed Terrans to evolve from tribal, nomadic primates, not entirely unlike their progenitors, to a space-faring race. Terran civilization developed to the point of relatively stable nation-states. With space travel, the nation-state evolved into the global state and the Terran species furthered its growth, both in material ways and in immaterial, philosophical ways. In time, the global state led to the inter-system state, which in turn led to the Galactic Terran Alliance, a galactic state. To date, Terrans have successfully colonized 12 worlds outside of the Sol system. 
Outposts have been established on 15 other planets and moons throughout the known galaxy. If the past is any indicator of future trends, unified expansionism will only continue to benefit the Alliance, both politically and economically. Vesadans originate on the fourth planet of the Vesada system, the only planet in that system that is capable of supporting life. Their home planet, also known as Vesada Prime, is a relatively hostile world. Both of the twin continents of Vesada Prime are almost entirely desert, and most of the above ground water is, even by Vesadan standards, undrinkable. In order to adapt to these surroundings, Vesadans developed quite rapidly. Vesadan society is complex and filled with peril for the outsider ignorant of their culture. Vesadans have a range of social tests and protocols, such as the conversation. A Terran mishandling of the conversation is presumed to be one of the major causes of the VT war. The Vesadan government is parliamentary in nature, but is presided over by the imperial family and the ambassadors, who are quasi-royal go-betweens for the parliament and the imperium. Vesadan space exploration has been driven primarily by the need to find planets capable of sustaining their species. As resources on Vesada Prime have diminished, the drive to colonize has intensified among Vesadans in recent decades. Despite what information we've been able to obtain, Shivans still remain, on many levels, an enigma to both the Terrans and the Vesadans. Their origin and their destination remain unknown. While many have offered up possible explanations as to why the Shivans seem focused on the destruction of all other sentient species, we still do not know why they seem bent on total xenocide. Shivans have multiple eyes, some of which seem to have the function of compound eyes, not unlike some varieties of insects. Shivans also have five legs, and can run equally well over a floor or over a ceiling. It has been hypothesized that Shivans may have spent their evolutionary process in a zero-gravity environment. Each Shivan leg ends in a very strong claw, capable of crushing even the sturdiest of known alloys. Parts of their thorax seem to act as compartments, such as ones that might be found on a space suit. It has been suggested that what we have actually seen have been either robots or organic creatures in some sort of exoskeleton. However, we have, at present, no reason to support either hypothesis. Most likely, we will not learn anything more about the Shivan species until we have actually captured and studied a Shivan.